Ladies and gentlemen, people always ask me, Jake, what kind of scripting do you actually do on the job? Like, do you do a lot of scripting? What programming languages are you scripting in? Uh, what does a system administrator actually do on the job with regard to scripting things out? So today I wanna to give you an example of a script that I had to write for a ticket that I had um, that's like a real world situation. So the ticket was that uh, we had an audit of one of our banks that the default administrator account for devices was not renamed. So it was still called administrator, which is a common attack vector. Um, uh, for like a security threat. So malicious actors will try and compromise that account and having it named administrator still is a bad idea. So the idea of the ticket was we need to rename that account to something else. Now I found that uh, I couldn't rename the account and I wasn't sure why. So I hopped into local users and groups and I realized that the account was disabled and that's why I couldn't rename it. So I had to enable the account. So that's the first part of the script is that I had to enable this uh, administrator account. Then I had a GPO set up so that it would rename the account. And then I realized that we had other local admins that were kind of sitting around on some devices, which is not good either. You don't want to have random local admins sitting around. So I was like, man, I need to clean up these local administrator accounts on these devices. So the idea of the script was I had to put together a list of acceptable local administrator accounts. And I had to also ensure, put a try catch clause to ensure that the administrator account was enabled so that the GPO to rename it could actually go through. And so I basically put together my list of my domain administrator account. Um, there was another administrator that we need to have. It's called an SPLA account and then my default administrator account. So the script will go through. It will check. Is that default administrator account enabled? If it's not enabled, enable it. But then there was another roadblock. I found that enabling the default administrator account was not possible if it didn't meet the password complexity requirements. So I had to put another clause into that uh, part of the script that enables that account, which was if it's not enabled, set a sufficiently difficult 18 character super complex password password temporarily so that it can be enabled. And so then the script enables the account and then again, the GPO can actually do its job renaming it. Now, once the script actually goes through and, and I've been testing this all this morning for about the last hour, kind of setting up these try catch clauses. And of course, I'm not writing all of this myself. I'm using ChatGPT and then looking over what it does and ensuring that everything looks right. But after it goes through and checks that that account is enabled, if it's not enabled, it sets that sufficiently difficult password, then it'll enable the account because it actually can, then GPO will hit and it'll actually rename that account. After all of that is set and done, we have our default administrator account renamed. And when it's renamed, LAPS, Local Administrator Password Solution, can actually manage the account and set a sufficiently difficult password, uh, an encrypted password, and then that saves that password to Active Directory. Okay, so why am I telling you all this? Well, having local administrators on your devices is pretty important. It's also pretty dangerous. Why is it dangerous? Well, it's dangerous because it's an administrator administrator account, any administrator account is a attack vector. You don't want to have a default administrator account named administrator with the password admin, for example. Uh, that's just a really easy attack vector. If you ever do get compromised, somebody can take over that account and take over your systems relatively quick and, you know, uh, privilege escalation and all that kind of cool stuff that you learn about in Try Hack Me and Hack the Box. But it's important to have a default, I shouldn't say default, it's important to have a local administrator on your devices that you can actually get into because when you have the PC plugged into the domain network, you can log in with domain admin credentials. So if I'm an administrator on the domain, you know, jakehallberg.dev, and I have a domain join device and it's on the network, I can hop in and use my administrator credentials, the, the ones that are actually stored in Active Directory. Well, if this device is not on the bank network and it's at home and you restart it, maybe it won't have cached my domain admin credentials because I haven't logged into it in, in 30 days or anything of that sort. So the only way that I can get into that device as an admin is with local administrator credentials. Okay, that's why this is important. Now, the thing about LAPS, local administrator password solution, is it is a group policy. You can do it through Intune as well, which in my opinion is a little bit better. It's also a little bit trickier, but that's going to rotate that local administrator password and store it in a centrally stored location like Active Directory or Entra, where an administrator can go and say, hey, this is the local password on this device. Uh, you know, it's dot backslash, I don't know, local admin or something like that is going to be my username. And then I can just grab that securely stored password that rotates on every certain rotation. You can set it up for 14 days, 30 days, 180 days, however you want. And you can use that to log in locally to the device and administer the device. Okay, so getting admin credentials on a device that is remote is something that when you first start at IT, you have to like be able to conceptualize, right? Like these, these devices don't work with domain credentials all the time because they're not on the domain network, if that makes sense. And what Windows devices do is they cache credentials too. So if a domain admin has recently logged into the device, it's gonna cache those credentials and those will hold. But let's say I change my password and the device is off 
the domain, it's not going to work anymore. I got a little bit long winded there, but so that's the meat of the script. It's checking that RID 500 basic account. Um, and this was a lot of troubleshooting that it took me to get to this point where I need to rename that default administrator account. The only way that I can do that is if it's enabled. The only way that I can enable it is if it has a sufficiently difficult password. So the script is about 105 lines long and it's got multiple tr try catch uh, clauses that are checking. Is it enabled? If it's not enabled, set a sufficiently difficult password and then enable it. And all of this came through troubleshooting. Um, now there was all, all, of course I had to put that clause in there because let's say that it's already enabled. I don't want to write a password to it if it's already enabled because that's what lapse is doing. And I don't want my script to be writing passwords that are kind of conflicting with laps, um, if that makes any sense. So I want laps to do its job. I want this little try catch clause to enable the account so that laps can do its job, but nothing else. So if the account is already enabled, it doesn't do anything. It doesn't write a password or anything like that. So that was an important part too. And when I'm doing this, again, I'm using ChatGPT. I'm telling it what I need. I'm deliberating and thinking about how I actually need to set this up in a robust way so that it works. Um, but again, so that there's not these conflicts and, and all of that type of stuff. Lots of testing backstage, because when you run a script backstage, it runs as system. And yeah, just ensuring things work. When I'm done, I actually prompted ChatGPT to, I looked over the whole script. I, I can read code good enough now that I've been doing this for as long as I have. Um, I've had to have in the past, ChatGPT really explain stuff to me, uh, but now it's gotten a lot easier to just, like it's it's pretty legible, right? PowerShell scripting is, is pretty straightforward, but I will still take the script and I'll put it into another AI, like Microsoft Copilot. And I'll tell ChatGPT, I need to ensure that this is robust, that this is safe, and that it's not doing anything that I don't want it to do. Like for example, if I forgot one of my domain admins that I want in my allowed admin list. And I'll say, hey, write me a prompt for Copilot to check over my own script, make sure that it's robust, make sure that it's safe, make sure that it's doing what I want it to do. And ChatGPT writes me a beautiful prompt. I take the prompt and the script, put it into another AI and check against that. That's an interesting way that, you know, I'm using AI as well. It's like a level of abstraction that I never thought I would get to where I'm prompting an AI to make a prompt for another AI to check a script that AI helped me write. And, you know, I've been working at this for maybe an hour this morning. If I had to do all of this myself, it probably would have taken me three hours. You know, it probably would have taken me significantly longer because I'm not a, like a scripting beast or anything like that. I haven't read 90 days of PowerShell or anything like that. I still understand the script. There's no PII, personally identifiable information in the script. So I'm not giving anything to AI, you know, that it wouldn't normally have, but really a nice way to set things up with best practices. All right, I'm getting long-winded. Appreciate you guys. Hopefully this has been useful in seeing how we actually use scripting in our day-to-day -day life. I'm gonna be making more videos like this, like what I'm actually doing, what kind of tickets I'm looking at, what's actually going on in my life. Appreciate y'all. Be safe, be smart, make some good decisions and good luck with those scripts. Bye.